You're about to deal with forces you can't possibly comprehend. You are now tuning in to the Going North Podcast with your host, best-selling author, professional speaker, and member of the John Maxwell team, Dominic Dom Brightman. And every Monday and Thursday, we're going to hear the voice of a different author sharing their gifts, stories, and expertise to help you charge forward in life. Now let's get on with the show. And today on the High Live Real Builder for all that's known as the Going North Podcast, we are back at you again, baby. Host to host, special baby, host to host, H2H instead of H2O. And we got one heck of a fabulous guest for you today, my friends. Best selling author, folks, best selling author of her own memoir, baby, her own fabulous memoir, certified dating and relationship coach who has a passion for helping others to learn how to date again after they have healed. And not only that, she's a mom of three and she's a glutton for punishment because she hosts two podcasts of her own. So let's give it up for the fabulous KS herself, not K Swiss, but Kelly Smith. How you doing today, Kelly? Thank you so much. That was an amazing introduction. I love that. I'm going to have to hire you whenever I walk into a restaurant or something like that. So everyone knows who's walking in. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. My pleasure, indeed. Welcome to the wonderful sanctum of dad jokes where you have to survive puns before the magic happens. Yes, yes, you do. You definitely do. (laughs) Yeah, but sometimes the puns are the magic. Sometimes. Yes, you're right. Sometimes they definitely can be. That's right. Where it's like you just move and they just get pie in the face for no reason with extra cream and extra custard for no reason. Yeah, that's that's usually the magic. (laughs) 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 That's funny. You had the visual in your head, didn't you? I did have the visual. (laughs) I did. I definitely did. (laughs) Thanks for that. (laughs) (laughs) But hey, it's not about pie on the face. It's about the kind Kelly herself. So am I filling in any cavities I missed about you? Um. I am originally from Boston, Massachusetts. I moved to Austin, I guess you'd say like maybe 17 years ago or so. I am an empty nester. I do have three boys that are all moved out and moved on, which is what they do, which is completely rude. Um, and I did just, uh, hop on to my first global summit, um, best ever you global summit. So I was super proud of myself for uh, being invited to that. So yeah, and I do have two podcasts, Relationship Dating Coach, Let's Get Wicked Deep, a dating podcast. And then the author podcast, which is how we met, a writing away with Kelly, where I have different authors come on my show each week to help promote and talk about their books. Because writing a book is a huge accomplishment. It's not easy. And I love to help promote people and all their hard work. And it's been great because I've met so many amazing people like yourself. And I do have to enjoy your jokes, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Don't Um, worry. It builds character. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely does. And I think it makes you grow, too, because I'm a little taller than from the first time I met you, so. Oh, good. And I'm, and I'm sure there are no heels required, either. No, nope, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, my goodness, my goodness. So, a dating and relationship coach, my goodness. So, with a lot of things, like usually those in entrepreneurship, it usually is one of those pain to power moments. So was there like a pain to power moment that led you to become a dating or relationship coach? Oh, that's a great question. There was. It was um, a horrible, toxic relationship that I endured for a few years that led me to healing in a recovery program, which then led me to feeling as if I was maybe the only one that had ever gone through something like this. But then once I started talking about my own story, realizing that other people have also gone through what I had gone through, I was like, I think it might be a good idea to start helping people. So it started off with my podcast years ago. Well, first the book and then the podcast. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to get certified so I can help people who were in toxic relationships learn to date again. And then from there, it just kind of grew a little bit. And now I help people who were in long-term relationships date again. Coming out of a long-term relationship is scary because it's like you 
feel like you've landed on like a different planet from when you were dating before you got married. So it's like, let me help you around this, this new world that you're about to explore. Cause it's very scary. So buckle up. Cause it can be a very bumpy ride. Oh yeah. I can say that again. It's like, yeah, especially now with the online dating and uh, trying to find a COVID cuddle buddy. Well, probably trying to find a buddy outside of COVID now, since things are starting to reopen bit by bit bit and brick by brick indeed yes, yes I, I heard the new opening line is which vaccination did you get <laughs> so apparently that's the new icebreaker so if you're out there dating ask the people what kind of injection they got for the vaccinations that's supposed to be the most creative opener right now well, there you go what kind of injection you got huh <laughs> <laughs> who did you get johnson and johnson who do you have are you a, a one time or a two time? Which one I am? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess if they're a two time, they need to run away then. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But it also means that they're faithful because they come back for the second one. So that's kind of good. It's a good sign. Johnson and Johnson's a one and done. And the other ones are definitely not. So pick your poison. <laughs> <laughs> that's right some of the vaccine haters are like yeah you're right pick your poison oh, yeah, they're that's not true. doing that to me yeah. definitely not what i meant but you know <laughs> <laughs> get your vaccine <laughs> unless you don't want it i don't know i'm not gonna tell anybody what to do yeah, exactly except for the mountains right the mountains oh my goodness <laughs> i don't know what what's gonna happen next i don't know <laughs> don't don't know. Worry. no one knows what happens next <laughs> my goodness what what i find interesting about you is the fact that when it comes to toxic relationship you mentioned that you yourself were the abuser in a relationship at one point which is something that folks will rarely admit out in the open so what gave you the courage to do that like what what happened to is it like a lot of glass bottles flying everywhere was it you just drop kicking them while you're wearing some camouflage like what happened no, actually, they, it was. It never got physical. There was never anything physical. That was in writing my book about my toxic relationship that I was in after my marriage had ended. Writing that in, in my recovery program, I realized that I had a lot of of the same traits that my toxic ex had. Then I said to really think about it, and I was like, "Wow, I was very toxic and very abusive, verbally, emotionally, mentally, with my ex husband." And then upon writing my book and with more research going into it, I realized where it all came from because we don't just wake up one day and decide to be abusive. We don't wake up one day and decide to stay in a toxic relationship. It comes from somewhere. So we have to figure out our whys. Why am I this abusive? Why am I allowing myself to stay? So in my history, when I was young, growing up, my mom was very abusive to my dad. She was very toxic. She put him down. She insulted him. She made fun of him. She public humiliation, all of that stuff in front of different people in front of us kids. And it was something that I just did when I, when I was older, as I kind of grew up. And when I got together with my ex-husband, I was only 16. So I was young. I was so young. He was 18. So I was brought up with this idea that in order to, you know, be with someone, you treat the man like a dirt. And literally that's not okay. So throughout this marriage, that's, I was very controlling. I was very codependent. I was narcissistic. And I can say that about myself because I was diagnosed with that. So I'm recovering from that. I had anger problems. I was a name caller. I did all of these things to him. And it wasn't until my abusive relationship where one day I did say to my ex-husband, I said, I think I met the male version of me, but worse. And he was like, you have to get out of that because in my toxic relationship, it, it was physical. Um, it took a little bit of time before it became physical, but when it came, when it became physical, it was physical. So it was, it was a rude awakening to learn all this stuff about myself. And then when I wrote my book, I wanted to talk about that because that's part of my story. That's part of how, you know, I ended up in something toxic myself. So I also want men to know that they are in they can be in abusive relationships as well that they can read this book and they can pick up on the signs of something that their wife or their girlfriend might be doing and they may be able to say this really isn't for me because if you're afraid to come home because men are afraid to come home 
they, you know, will, you know, make it seem like, oh, I just don't want to listen to her talk. I don't want to deal with her crap. They don't want to go home because their stomachs are turning as they're turning down their roads. They don't want to go home and face whatever it is they're going to face. When I was married, my ex-husband would come home and I would be mad at him because he got to go to lunch at work and I had to be home all day dealing with the kids. What? So these are the things that men face. You know, when they're going home, they're having this life, they're out there working, they're doing their thing. And a lot of women expect them to come in, you know, take the kids and, and let her go do whatever it is that she needs to do. And that's not how that goes. I mean, it's a very interesting situation, but it was something I had to write about, something I had to admit to the world and to say, hey, this is what I did. This is what I was capable of, but this is kind of my comma. And then how I was able to change and make a better life for not only myself, but for my kids as well. And now my ex-husband and I get along really well, which is good. Ah, uh, yeah. It's kind of funny how that happens. It's like with some folks, it's like in, when they're in marriage, they're that close to each other within the home. They could be the worst enemies ever or the best enemies ever. And then when they separate a bit, it's like, hey, this person's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not living yeah. with them anymore. And it's like, oh, hey, so bad of a person when they're, you know, not right next to me in the same bed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's so true what they say. It's like, you know, distance makes the hat grow fonda. And a lot of people that I've noticed, women in particular, do not like it when their spouses, their boyfriends, whatever, have their own lives. They are against that. They want them all with them all the time. And it's, and it's a stressful thing. It causes anxiety for the men too, because when you get together with someone very rarely, and I don't think this has ever happened, do you go to a surgeon and get surgically attached? Oh, we're in a relationship now. We have to do everything together. And that's just not accurate. That's not healthy. You should each have your own lives and then have a life together. And there's nothing wrong with that. Oh, yeah, that's right. To make the perfect yin yang symbol, got to have that white, black with the dots in the middle as well. It's like, hey, can't be surgically together all the time. Like, you don't want to be the darn Siamese twins in 2021. <laughs> in, in any, any time. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be that. Like, you don't want to have to have that. And I think, like, when a lot of people get into, which is, I think this is the reason why men don't like the title of relationship because they feel when they get into something that the woman is now entitled to passwords and where are you going and what are you doing and who are you going out with and show me your phone and why are you liking these pics and why are you doing this? So when men hear the word relationship, they're like, no, I'm going to go ahead and not do this. Because a lot of times when that label changes, I feel that a lot of women, men too, but mostly women think that now they have more like ownership, if you will, of what this person is doing. And they don't have any ownership because a relationship should just be two people, you know, being together, supporting each other, lifting each other up, celebrating, being sad or whatever it is. They don't have to combine lives together. That's not how that works. Yes, there should be respect, but there should never be control or demanding or you can't go out, you can't do this, you can't hang out with Johnny anymore because he's single and he likes hot girls. Yes, it's crazy stuff that I've heard and I'm just like, oh no, that's not how any of this works, you know? So it's making sure that before you get into a relationship, you are healthy enough to be in a relationship where you have your own life, you have your own job, you have everything you need in case this person leaves. If this person leaves and you fall apart, then you are way too attached to this person. Having your own life, your own friends will help you with that. So you're not so attached. Oh yeah, definitely say that again. Indeed. Definitely. Yeah. Cause it's so true. Like, especially nowadays where like there's so many options out there for both men and women to advance further than ever, where it's like, Hey, we have our own separate lives here. Let's uh, come together. See if we can make more magic happen as opposed to one really having control over the other, like a little marionette, like that doesn't work out for either party because one's gonna hate the other <laughs> after a while yeah yeah because I, I know from being on both sides of the fence that being the controller is exhausting mentally it's draining and being controlled 
makes you just want to run away and jump off a bridge because you're like, uh, but I can't jump off the bridge because I wasn't given permission. So it's a really <laughs> tough sort of, you know, situation to be in. So when you're with someone, letting them make their own decisions and seeing who they are naturally is going to help you. Because if you start to control their decisions and their choices, you're never going to know who they really are. And what fun is that? Uh, there won't be any bun with that fun. No, there probably won't be. Somebody else will be getting that bun. So it's like, be very careful, you know, about how you are. And if you, if you are, you know, a man or a woman and you know, you're controlling, you know, you're jealous, you know, you're all these things, try to get a lot of that stuff, you know, in check before you get into a relationship. But at the same time, when you're in a relationship, your partner should also be able to help you through, you know, certain things. If they feel like, okay, this person needs reassurance, which I think is something that humans in general just need. So if you find yourself with someone that's like, get your own reassurance, that might not be the right person for you because you want to have that partner that can support you and understand, all right, this person's been through some stuff. Let me help her along a little bit. That's okay because we're all flawed. None of us are going to go into a relationship completely perfect. We need each other to help each other out, help each other build and grow and build that trust. Building that trust is so, so difficult but it is the number one ingredient you need to make this recipe come together. Ah, uh, so speaking of recipes, what do you think are the three major things focus, <laughs> focus, funny, three things that folks should focus on when they're in that mode where they're single and they're probably re in a recovery period, maybe before they even try even looking for love in this case, because that's the major thing going on, I'd say, right now is a lot of folks are mentally beaten down and they're slowly recovering if that like some are still struggling heck even before the whole pandemic last year like mm -hmm. on top of that and everything so right any three things you think folks should focus on before trying to seek out some love yeah i definitely think they should focus on being single being single is the best being single is fun it's exciting uh, you get to know who you are because when something ends and you're out of something and you're in that space between no longer and not yet, we are not the same people that we were like going into the relationship now coming out, we're completely different. So be single, get to know yourself, figure out who you are, travel, maybe start a new hobby and just have fun. I would say that is definitely the most important thing. The other thing that I think people should really focus on while they're enjoying their singleness is where did they go wrong in their previous relationship? Like okay, this relationship just ended. He did X, Y, and Z. That's on him. What did I do that I could improve on? Where was I weak? Where was I not stable enough, I guess you could say, or where was I not my best? What should I be working on with myself? So healing from your past relationships, even if you feel, even if it wasn't toxic or abusive, we still have to heal. We have to figure out being single, having fun, take ourselves out on dates. So being single, healing and getting to know yourself a lot better and also figuring out what your boundaries are going to be in the next relationship and what you really want out of your next relationship are you in that phase where you just want to be casual and just meet a bunch of people and have fun if you are amazing but let the people know that are you feeling like now that you had a relationship that wasn't that great now you want something to, to be like you know, more consistent, more long-term, then focus on that. But again, make sure you tell the people that. Because I think right now, especially with this virus, and in Texas, we just had this winter storm. So we were without a lot for a lot of days and a lot of people were stuck on their own. I was alone for a while in it. I lost water, I lost heat, I ran out of food. And I was like, you know what? This is tough to go through alone. So not only do we go through this virus by ourselves, but now we're going through these other things alone. And I think when we're in that time where we are by ourselves, we tend to think like this would be much better with another person. And that kind of changes our mindset. Lord, now it's like, kind of want to date with more intention, kind of want to find a long-term partner. So be single, heal, and focus on what you really want out of your next relationship. Ah, there we go. Some three pack abs right there. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's right. Three pack dating abs. There you go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's my three pack. <laughs> That's right. Bunny funny indeed. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, but yeah, definitely a good point. Enjoying the singleness indeed, because it's so true. Like with the singleness, especially it's like, you don't have to worry about someone's like, man, where the heck were you were this so late of a time. And folks just clock watching the whole freaking time and the possible jealousy. And of course, <laughs> A classic example you mentioned earlier about the phone and the passwords and everything. It's like, yeah. hey, wait a second here. <laughs> yeah. like, come on. I'm all person. Don't worry. I don't need to slide the DMs. I'm only sliding you doing at the moment. It's all good. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. And that's where the reassurance comes from, definitely, with you know, people kind of like that reassurance. So yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely interesting. So I I did start writing, I wrote my next book and it's gonna be out hopefully soon, maybe next month. But I write about going from a toxic relationship to a, a healthy relationship and what that looks like. And when your new healthy partner goes out and all the, the different things that you kind of go through from being in something abusive to something healthy. And that's definitely one of them where it's like figuring out what kind of a woman or what kind of a man you want to be, not what kind of a wife, sister, friend or whatever, but what kind of a woman do you want to be? I didn't want to be that woman who was like, when are you coming back? Where are you going? Who are you going with? I wanted to be the woman that said, have fun. Call me when you get home. Now, on the other side of that, I melted down completely and totally. Of course, he has no idea that that had happened. But what you show them is one thing. And then what you do behind the scenes is something usually completely different. So is it okay to freak out behind the scenes? Absolutely. As long as they don't know. You know, it's do whatever it is you have to do to kind of get through it. And then once that trust begins to build, once that reassurance comes in, then it's, yeah, okay, have fun. I'm going to watch my Bridezilla shows because you hate them so much. Now I get to have the whole night to myself, which I think people forget. So when you get used to being single and you love being single, like I love being single, you want that alone time. You want it when they say, I'm going to go out with my friends. Oh, no, please don't. Okay, have a nice night. You know, where it's like, go do your thing because I have these TV shows that have been like stacking up. Right. It's like forget Netflix and chill. It's just flicks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's literally like TLC and Bravo. Have a nice night. I have some shows to catch up on. So and that's the glory of it. Because when you're when you learn how to be single and you're completely fine being single, when your person works like a crazy job and can't be there for Christmas or can't celebrate your birthday or can't be there for a um, you know festival that you want to go to. What are you going to do? Sit home and cry and say, oh no, I can't. Or go find some side piece to do that stuff with. No, you have to be secure enough in yourself that if they can't be around, then you're going to be okay. And that is how you know you're on the right track and how you know you're healthy because you're okay on your own, even in a relationship. Oh, yeah, definitely can say that again. And that can be another powerful point you brought up is the power of boundaries. It reminded me of um, one of our past guests last year, Nancy Levin, one of our guests from the summer, where she wrote a whole entire book about setting boundaries because that was one of the major things that held her back from getting this level of success that she currently has now because she was married to someone and then divorced them because they weren't a good match. And then as she was going along, she was like Wonder Woman trying to do everything for everybody. And that ended up taking its toll, not only in that relationship, but also on her health as well. So what really helped you to really find out that boundaries are integral to basically a healthy, basically a healthy life altogether? You know, it's, um, it's stuff for me, I had like different boundaries because of the abusive relationship that I was in. So I was, I guess you could say like more in tune to certain things that I was willing to accept and things that I wasn't willing to accept. Um, so of course we have our, our deal breakers, you know, like what, what do we not want to have? What are we not looking for? And a lot of people are like, um, you know, for me, it's drug abuse and alcohol and like a history of uh, arrests. And, and I'm not saying people who have been arrested are bad. I'm not saying that at all, but it's like, you know, a, a rap sheet or a file sort of thing is, is not normally a good thing. And like, you know, figuring out what we are okay with and what we're not okay with. And with the boundaries, we have to learn to say no. We have to learn to say, you know what? Every Sunday I go to brunch with my friends. I will not be seeing you on Sundays, sorry. And the best part about setting up your boundaries is seeing someone's reaction. So if you're dating for a few months and he says to you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And he says, do you see your friends every Sunday? I want to see you on Sunday. All right, buddy. Well, I told you the beginning. This is what I do on Sundays. And if he reacts to that, then you know, ooh, 
probably not going to be a good fit because this is a boundary showing up at someone's house unexpectedly not cool not cool no do not do that so there are certain things where if you're at home having fun or doing whatever it is and then all of a sudden this person's at your door and hey i was just driving in the neighborhood uh, yeah you can go ahead and go home because you're not coming into my house so it's you know i don't want to sleep at someone's house i don't want to do these certain things and i think the boundaries are like not only to keep you safe and to keep you comfortable but also to see how people react to them because you'll find out a lot about a person when you tell them no some people just do not like that others are like yeah that's fine with me so when i first started dating someone he had his boundaries and i was like okay because i know what it feels like to be in bed sleeping at three o'clock in the morning and there's your ex standing there looking at you where it's like oh my gosh so you know when i have set up my my boundaries there there and then i will respect other people's boundaries like crazy because i i don't want to break those because i know how it feels also if you meet someone and you want them to stay, respect their boundaries. Exactly. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. That's right. It's like honey instead of vinegar. It's like that's how you get them to stay, right? Yes, it is. Just be nice and do the things that you would want to do. And as if you have a person, you're screaming at them, where are you going? What are you doing? We've been dating for three weeks. I don't want you dating other people. <laughs> You know, that's not going to get them to stay. That's going to get them to run, pack their bags and move to a different country because it's like, I don't want to deal with this, you know? So it's being patient, taking your time, respecting boundaries and really paying attention to who the people are to see if they will fit into your life, not if you will fit into theirs. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you don't want to put a size seven foot in a size 13 shoe. It's not going to work. No, that was going to be so uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. It'll be like big feet, wooden, like wooden clogs almost, basically. <laughs> yeah, you're tripping everywhere. you bashed up. It won't be, you can't go anywhere. You can't dance. I can't dance anyway. Maybe it would help. I don't know. But yeah, it just wouldn't be comfortable at all. It would be horrible. So yeah, I think really getting to know someone before you take that leap into being in, in a relationship with them is huge. Ah, that's what I'm talking about indeed. So my goodness, so mention being a mom with three grown boys that are now out on their own. So how did that, did that affect you at all with the dating after the, leaving the toxic relationship? Um, it was interesting because obviously at one point they weren't gone. So they, I, I was, I'm the kind of mom that, would never tell my kids, okay, you're at dad, so don't come here or call me before you come here. I was never that mom. I always felt, and my ex-husband felt the same way where if they wanted to come over, you, they want to come home, come home. So dating was a little bit interesting because I would never have like anyone really come to my house because you just never know when a kid would show up. And there were plenty of times where I'd be sitting there and like they would just pop up and I'm like, oh, hey, thank God I didn't have like anybody there because I wasn't even though they were older, my kids saw me go through hell in my toxic relationship. They witnessed their mom in situations they should never have. And I don't ever want them to see me in a situation like that again. So for me, bringing a man around them is massively important. Where if I'm willing to bring a man around my kids, then I feel a lot for this person. Like I feel like this would be a long-term thing. So yeah, it was definitely interesting. So the dating I did was outside of the house and all of that was never really around them. They've only met one person since I've been doing this and that's it. So it's, you know, and it, and they're older. My oldest is 26. Like I'm still not good. I would still not bring around, you know, three or four different guys because now he's 26 and he's probably going to be like, what the hell is my mom doing? Cause you're still a mom, you know, in their eyes, you're still a mom. So it's like, they don't want to see you hurting. They don't want to see you you know, with different guys, like, that's not cool. So I was very uh, careful with dating with these kids around and even now. So same thing. Ah, beautiful indeed. That's what I'm talking about. Some magical honor right there. That's right. That's what I'm talking about indeed. So since this is not your first rodeo, is there a question that you wish you'd be asked more often when you're on the guest side of the game on these magical podcasts? I don't know. I haven't really thought about it, actually. 
<laughs> I am always asking the question, so I don't know. I don't know what I would even like to be asked. Um, no, I mean, I know, not really, because I was, no, I don't know. It's a great question. Ah, uh, it's okay. It's okay. Well, speaking of podcasts, you got two of them. So why two? Like one's enough sometimes. <laughs> speaking from experience. One, one is enough. I, you know, one is enough. So two, it's, um, I have this situation where I just finished, I wrote my first book, obviously. And then I wrote my second book, which is coming out soon. And then I just sent over to my publisher, my third book. So my third book, my first book is memoirs, like you said, the second book is the follow-up to that. So the aftermath of toxic relationships and what happens in, in dating healthy, that sort of thing. So now that that's kind of done and, and put apart and I'm much more healthy than I've ever been, I don't need to write about myself anymore. So now I'm writing fiction books. So fun. Oh my gosh. So when I decided to start writing this fiction book, I was like, man, this stuff is so hard to promote. So I decided to start interviewing authors. And I'm so grateful that I did because even though it is a ton of work with two shows, I have met the most incredible people throughout this author podcast process. Like so many people that have turned into friends because it, for me, it was like, I don't have a lot of people, if any, in my life where I can say, guess what my character just did? And they would look at me like I'm, I'm crazy. And I'm like, I <laughs> want to talk about what I just found out my character is doing this and people don't want to hear it. But now that I have people that I've become friends with, I can send them a text and be like, guess what this bitch just did? And they're like, why? And they want to know. And they're like, what did she do? Tell me. So it's really a, a fun sort of thing, but it is sometimes difficult because I get a lot of, not a lot of things, but I get some things mixed up. Then I have people who are like dating coaches who want to be on the author podcast, um, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been fun. And I'm trying to pick like, do I want to be a dating coach or do I want to be an author? But every time I try to pick one, the other one catches up to it. So now I'm like driving down the highway with two speeding cars, each a podcast. And I don't know which car I'm jumping into. So it's been really fun. It's, yeah, a lot of work, but also a lot of fun. Uh, so you don't know which one to be or talking about like with what show to be your main show or like something else? Yeah, like which direction I kind of want my own career to go in. Like, do I want to like really focus on coaching or do I want to really focus on being an author? But I really want to focus on both. So, and the good news is with having my kids as young as I did, now I'm living by myself. So I have the time to invest and to put into continuing to write my books and to coach people with their relationship concerns. So I, it's, I have a passion for both. So if I'm talking to someone about relationships, I'm all in it. But if I'm talking about my books, I'm all in it. So it's, it's great to have two amazing passions like that that I can actually fulfill my life with. So it's, it's been fun. Ah, there you go. Some fun on the bun. Magic indeed. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, because it definitely can be hard because with like the whole life thing, it's easy. So I'm, just a, I'm a dating relationship coach and I got this fabulous book too that shares some backstory and you can combine that with the coaching, but doing that on top of the podcast too every week and staying on top of that mm -hmm. and everything else that could definitely be a uphill battle, that could, but in a good way since you're enjoying it. Yeah, because I release on on Wednesdays, I release the author podcast and Fridays, I release the relationship coach podcast. So I do two a week. And the other day, my friend was like, do you want to go to spin? I'm like, let me look at my calendar. And I'm like, I can fit you in maybe on March 22nd. And he was like, oh, my God. He's like, just have your people call my people. <laughs> so it's interesting because I'm trying to like fit in you know, all these different things. But at the same time, I just I just think it's really fun. And. I figured out how to edit my own podcast. So bonus. Yeah. It's I'm, I'm a work in progress. I feel as if I'm 900 years old when it comes to technology. So I'm like, how do I do this? So I figured it out. 900 years old with technology. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand any of it. I tried to make a Facebook ad the other day and I almost cried, but I did figure it out. So luckily no one sees me breaking down in tears yelling at my computer. Oh yeah, technology. Yeah, um, yeah. We've all had our technology moments, technology stories. 
Yes. Comes, it's, uh, you know, part of the course, comes with the territory for sure. Yep. Yep. I remember losing two hours of editing work on a podcast episode. I was so mad. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. That's, that. that's why I save every other minute when I edit my episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I understand that when your heart's about to fall out of your body, you're like, oh my gosh. So it's, I had to learn how to do all this. And it was like making a decision. Like, do you want to save in segments? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that. So it's, it's scary, but I finally figured it out. So thankfully. Ah, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Indeed. Sweet. So I got these fabulous podcasts, got the fabulous books, and now you're in the fiction realm and really just breaking I guess really the <laughs> rules because a past guest on the show talks about how one of the folks in the writer's guild told him like, hey, when you're writing books, make sure you stick to one genre. So that way when folks read your stuff, they know you for that stuff. But at the same time, it's like this is 2021 at this point. It's like you can't really put yourself in a box and like mm -hmm. and sometimes you may even really break out of your shell and get a bigger audience by following your passion heck even actually another guest on the show so I, I, I forgot her name was it was like back in december she mentioned how she told this one guy to write the book that he was passionate about because she did it herself and that became her first ever award-winning book because she followed her passion so really it's just finding out where your passion is and like see where the pull is and just following that mm-hmm yeah, I think so. I, there's no way I could write fantasy. No way. I interview a lot of people who wrote fantasy on my podcast. I'm like, how do you even come up with this stuff? Like, there's a lot of stuff I, I couldn't even attempt to do. Some of these, you know, genres I'm just not interested in, like writing. I couldn't do it. But I think if you have, if you have multiple genres, do it. What the heck, you know? Yeah, it's easy. Just picture a pink golf ball inside of your mind. It'll be fine. Yes, I've heard you say that before. <laughs> yeah. That before. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Just just picture a pink golf ball inside of your mind and then a rubber ducky just floating past you on a lake. It'll be fine. You'll, you'll be good. <laughs> you should put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It makes for a great visual. That's right. It's provocative. It gets the people going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, a good movie. Heck yeah. That's right. The Blades of Glory. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Gets them going north indeed. So my goodness, so with this wonderful fiction book, so do you think it'll be a billionaire vampire romance book? No. Oh, okay. No, I don't know anything about these um, vampires. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I don't, I don't think so. But I don't know, it just, you know what the thing is though? It's just, it's been, um, with the fiction, it's been fun. I had a lot of fun with it. And I was like, man, this is the, it was probably the happiest I've been in a long time, which is writing the fiction. Because it was like, I got to, I kind of think like my first two books were great and I really enjoyed somewhat of writing them. But I think uh, opening up to fiction is definitely where I've always wanted to be since I was little. And now I feel like I got these two out. I have my publisher was, you know, like, yeah, we want to publish this. So I was like, oh, so I'm good enough for that. That's amazing. So now I'm just going to try my hand at, um, at fiction. So we'll see. They might reject it and be like, get this garbage out of here. But We'll have to find out, wait and see what they say. But I'm just, I'm excited that I was able to finish it, that I was able to do it and coming up with the people and, and their life stories and what they look like. And you know what funny story is at the end of it, I had to go back and edit because every single character had red hair. Hmm. Wonder where I got that from. Yeah, probably from me. Definitely from you. I was wondering if you were going to pick up on that or not, but you did yeah. it. It's like, yeah, yeah, the hair looks black from a distance, but it's really red. It's like the darkest red ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, every person <laughs> ended up having like red hair and green eyes. And I was like, why do they all have red hair? I'm like, where does it even come from? I don't know. Go figure, right? Yeah, it's like a Rubik's Cube. 
yeah, such a life's one of life's mysteries. So it was definitely fun, you know, to do all that and to kind of create all the characters and have a great time with it. So I'm excited to see what happens with it. So maybe it'll be a billion dollar non-vampire book, but we'll see. It's all good. It's all good. That's right, indeed. So we're coming down to the magical question that every guest gets to receive. And that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you were 25 again, but this time in 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Hmm. Look at you. I think I would say to myself, if I woke up 25 in, in 2021, um, I would say, uh, keep working out. I'd also say start writing your books a lot sooner um, and learn how to say the word no a lot more often. Yeah, that's right. That jab, jab, right hook combo right there. That's right. Hit him with that two piece right there. That's right. That's right. Stay in that gym. Write them books. Say no. That's right. It's like drugs. Just say no. Yes, definitely say no to drugs. That's right. Definitely. That's right. Unless you were a tree once, but that's a whole other story. Uh, yeah, that would definitely be a <laughs> sure. That would be <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh, God. But yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So for those who want to keep in magical contact with the special K herself, Kelly, what's the best way folks to reach out to you, buy your books and all that wonderful smooth jazz? Um, so check out my website, which is bebravecoaching.org. I have um, all my contact information on that website and also my featured authors are on that website as well if you want to tune in and listen to those interviews about those books and stuff like that you can check that out as well and all my social media links are on there as well well there you have it folks head over to be brave coaching.org baby that's right org is short for organ baby let me stop don't play no organs around here well I actually do play organs around here just on a different episode and head over to kelly's website buy all of her books share with your friends and when you buy the book make sure you keep it so that way she doesn't find you and drop kick you i'm telling you just buy the book tell your friends about it tell your cat about it tell your penguin camel and goldfish about it so that way they can stay away from them toxic penguins and those toxic dogs indeed because they may wolf away from you if you do so any parting words before we close up shop kelly um i, just don't, <laughs> I don't even know i i don't um <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> if I have any words I don't anymore, I think you maybe use them all with that little ring. That's funny. <laughs> no, but thank you. <laughs> How's that for a used car salesman bit? <laughs> I do used car salesman even say stuff like that? I don't I don't know. That's hilarious. I don't know. I don't know who says stuff like that, but yeah, that it literally just happened. So now you, you say that. That's so funny. But no, I just I thank you for having me on your show today. It was a lot of fun and I appreciate your time. You just got done listening to another powerful, power-packed episode of the Going North Podcast. I hope you really enjoyed what you heard. You made it all the way to the end. You get to hear all sorts of goodness. I was the best, but you just got done hearing some goodness. Go check out the guest stuff. It's all in the show notes on the website, dombreitman.com. And also reach out to those that you've just heard as well. And keep rocking it. Because you, yourself, are phenomenal for making it this far. And keep going north.